So it's wonderful to be here. Um, there's a lot of things that we could talk about today in terms of corpus use, corpora, using corpora for language teaching and so on. And I'm really interested in that topic. But today I'm going to be vo focusing on just kind of this narrow issue of looking at variation. Uh, I was trained as a historical linguist many, many, many years ago, looking at historical change in Spanish and Portuguese. So I've always considered myself in part a historical linguist, um, but over time I've become increasingly interested in genre-based issues and, and dialectal issues as well. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So these corpora are, um, the corpora that I'll be talking about, these, as Tony mentioned, are from english-corpora.org. And uh, I'm going to be focusing today on three main corpora. I'll be talking about coca to look at uh, genre-based variation. I'll start out with that and then talk about dialectal variation with globe, which is about 2 billion words from 20 different English-speaking countries. And then I'll finish up and hopefully I'll be able to spend a good half of the time um, talking about historical change. And I'll be talking about, I'll be using COA, Corpus of Historical American English, as well as some other corpora. So um, size is not everything when it comes to corpora. Not at all, not at all. Uh, there's many um, uh, features that make a corpus useful or not, but certainly um, with really large corpora, it allows us to look at a wide range of phenomena that we can't with corpora that are a lot smaller. So for example, COA uh, at 400 million words is about 100 times as big as the Brown family of corpora. Globe at 2 billion words is about 100 times as big as the uh, International corpora, Corpus of English. That's not to say that Brown and Ice aren't great corpora. They are. They're wonderful corpora. I'm just saying, once we have these really, really large corporate, now we can begin to look at some additional things. And um, I uh, address this issue in this uh, article. Uh, it's actually the, the introductory article uh, in uh, Doug Biber and Randy Reppin's book on uh, Cambridge Handbook of English Corpus Linguistics, chapter one there, kind of talks about the issue of size and what we can do with larger corpora. Just to give you a real quick uh, example of this, and then we'll jump into looking at variation. Um, there's this interesting construction in English where it's the perfect plus, um, so we have the perfect plus the progressive plus the passive. So for example, he had been being watched. So if you look that up, for example, in, um, the British National Corpus, a million words, it says that there are two tokens for this. So two tokens, not a whole lot you can do. If you go to COCA, so this is a billion words. Um, now we move up to uh, a few more tokens and corpora a little bit slower here than I'm expecting today. Uh, we got about 41 tokens for that. So we get about 20 times as much data. And then if you go up to iWeb, we're talking about uh, over 600 tokens. So obviously this is a low frequency construction, no question about that. But the point here is that with large, large corpora, almost nothing at that point becomes too infrequent of a construction. Uh, you know, the fact that in iWeb, you get 300 times as much data as in the BNC, kind of shows you that size can be useful. But it truly is a balancing act between corpus size and being able to look at variation. iWeb, it's 14 billion words, but you can't look at historical change. You can't look at different countries very well. You can't look at genres, certainly. And so at a certain point, if you're going to have 10, 20, billion words of data, it, you may not have a corpus that really allows you to look at variation as well as you'd like. So, you know, there might be this sweet spot somewhere around one, two billion words 
where it's large, you, you do have quite a bit of data, but it's still manageable in terms of um, dividing up the text by genre or by dialect or whatever. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna start out talking about uh, looking at genre-based variation. I'll do this fairly quickly because I think most people are pretty familiar with this type of thing. Then I'll move on to dialects, especially historical. Um, so uh, many of you are probably familiar with uh, the Longman corpus that Viber and others did back in the 1990s. This was about 40 million words, which for that time was a really good sized corpus. But of course, um, Viber's 1999 book um, on uh, variation in English genres um, is you know, the Bible for looking at genre-based issues in English. I, no one's ever gonna come close to that, I don't think. And if you've used that book, you've seen the kind of data that I'm gonna be showing you here, but I'm gonna go through it kind of quickly anyway. So in COCA, uh, at the most basic level, you can go in and you can type in a word or a phrase, syntactic construction, then you can see its frequency across the major genres. So blogs, other web pages, TV and movie scripts, that's very, very, very informal. Spoken fiction, magazine, newspaper, and academic, okay? So we're looking at the word bling here, which means kind of ostentatious display of wealth and shiny things, jewels and stuff like that. And when we click on magazine, we see that this is the most common in entertainment and also men and women. So this is kind of fashion as well as African-American. And that's kind of what you'd expect if you're familiar with the English word bling. Or for example, the word awesome. Oops, doesn't help that I didn't have the full URL there. So awesome. Um, Notice the frequency here in kind of these core genres, spoken fiction, magazine, newspaper, academic. But it's really interesting, this word, which is very, you know, has really, really increased over time. It's about five times as frequent as it was 20, 30 years ago. Awesome is the most frequent in these kind of new genres in COCA, blogs, other web pages, and TV and movie scripts. The point here, is that if we didn't, these, genre, these genres were added to COCA just three or four months ago. If we didn't have those, we really would not be getting uh, a full spectrum of use in English for this particular word. Okay, so those are very simple things. We're just looking at um, a particular word or phrase. In this case, so moving on to morphology here, and all I'm doing, the simple search says, Find me a word that ends in A-L and is an adjective. And when you take a look at this, we've got national, social, political, international, medical, financial, and so on. It's really quite striking how these A-L adjectives, uh, how common they are in academic compared to the other genres. So any suffix, prefix, root that you're interested in, and you wanna see how it plays out across genres, you can do that. Okay, so if you're familiar with the Longman Grammar and Viber, you're familiar with searches like this, we're looking at the passive, a form of B, followed by a past participle. So this is the B passive. And you can see that in rough terms, the more formal the genre, so moving towards academic, the more common this construction is. But again, it's really quite interesting that web genres, blogs and webs, give academic a run for their money in terms of frequency. And then kind of the alter ego of the B passive is the get passive. So, you know, got, John got fired from his job as opposed to John was fired from his job. And what's interesting here is how the get passive decreases in frequency over uh, between informal and formal genres. So there's kind of this uh, seesaw, uh, tug war, uh, what's the tug of war going on uh, between the B passive 
and the get passive. And the get passive, bit by bit by bit, is killing off the be passive. Okay, uh, another example of just looking at frequency across genres is the, uh, this is the quoted of like, and I mm, like, I'm not going to go out with her, okay? Um, so, you know, you, we got about 3,000 tokens here from Spoken. Uh, drive us crazy and they're like, oh, you can't stand me. I love it. it's like, Lord, help make the decision. It's so like, but, and I, he was like, well, then prove it. Um, the point here is when you take a look at the genres, um, again, TV and movies, very, very informal, okay, but actually spoken in this case for this particular construction uh, has per million words, even more tokens of this very, very colloquial. Uh, construction, the quoted of like. Um, other things that you can do in terms of looking at uh, genre-based variation, you can put in a construction and then you can say, show me the frequency here by sections. So here I'm looking at verb followed by possessive, followed by way, followed by uh, preposition. So for example, made his way to the kitchen, work his way through the problems. And so for each of the matching strings, many, 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 many different strings here, you can see uh, kind of the frequency of each of these in each of the eight macro genres. And the first thing you should probably notice or that you'd probably notice here is just how frequent these are in fiction compared to the other genres. Um, I want to actually, well, maybe I'll do the search, but this one takes a long, 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 long time because we're looking at this very high frequency construction, verb followed by an adverbial particle. So here we're looking at things, uh, phrasal verbs, okay? And so it's looking at all the phrasal verbs in fiction then all the phrasal verbs in academic, in the billion words of text. And these are the phrasal verbs that are much more common in fiction. And notice a lot of movement, you know, obviously a lot of informal stuff, uh, compared to the phrasal verbs in academic, which are talking about argumentation and how processes are carried out and that type of thing. So if you wanna compare one genre to another genre, what occurs here, but doesn't occur here, you can do that really easily. Um, so that's syntactic uh, variation uh, between genres. But with a sufficiently large corpus, we can also do interesting things in terms of semantics, looking at the meaning of a given word in different genres. So here I'm looking at collocates, noun collocates of chain in fiction versus academic. So we got fiction on the left here. And notice in fiction, chain refers to a physical chain, a gold chain, something you're wearing around your neck, for example, or a chain link fence. Whereas an academic chain is more metaphorical, more figurative. It's referring to a sequence of things. Okay. So anyway, um, those are all examples, just very, very quickly, of using um, COCA to look at genre-based variation in Lexis, morphology, syntax, semantics. May come back to that a little bit later, but for right now, let's leave it there. All right, so um, that's COCA. And uh, of course, we can do the same type of thing with the B and C. Uh, much smaller, of course, uh, just about 10th the size of COCA, but the B and C genre is, of course, extremely, extremely well-developed, um, probably the best you're gonna find in any large-ish corp, uh, corpus, the uh, people who created that uh, 30 years ago did a great job in that respect. Okay, um, let's move on to talking about GLOBE. So GLOBE is a really useful corpus, I think, in terms of looking at variation between uh, countries. So GLOBE is composed of about 2 billion words of data from 20 different English speaking countries. Um, most of the, well, all of these are countries where English has at least some 
semi-official, at least, status. That's why Germany and China and Japan are not in here. Okay? So we got about 2 billion words, and the point is we can just compare anything across uh, those 2 billion words. So actually, let me come back to globe here. So at the most basic level, I mean, if you're interested just in a particular word or phrase, you could put in, for example, banjaxed, which is something from Ireland, which means really messed up, screwed up. And you can see that it's limited primarily to Ireland, okay? Or for example, um, Eve teasing. So here, what's interesting, it's not one country, rather it's a region. So we have South Asia here, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And Eve teasing, which means um, kind of sexual harassment, um, is that term is limited primarily to that region. So it might not, not be just a country, it might be an entire region that we're looking at. Um, this morning when uh, Professor Rajan was speaking, I noticed uh, he talked about nook and crannies versus nook and corners. And so actually I should come back and I wanna see the frequency in each of these 20 countries. And he mentioned that nook and corner, nook and corners was limited primarily to India and other countries in South Asia. And when you look at it, yeah, it really is. Other countries use nook and crannies, but nook and corners is what is used in South Asia. And even phrases, uh, things like rather more adjective, Uh, you can see how much more frequent it is in Great Britain than the other dialects. I mean, to my ears, this sounds like English from the 1880s. Uh, certainly nothing that I would use, but in Great Britain, still very, very common. So it's not just words, it's also constructions. Looking at morphology, um, we can use Globe to do that as well. So for example, uh, English has two uh, past forms of sneak, sneak, and snuck. So here we have pronouns sneak, he, they sneaked in through the back window. Notice there's not huge differences between what might be referred to as the inner circle dialects there, those six. But then when you take a look at pronoun snuck, much, much more common in the US and Canada than in Great Britain or Ireland. That's something that kind of um, sounds very, very American to folks who are not from the US. Uh, looking at syntactic uh, variation between dialects, COA or uh, excuse me, GLOBE can be very useful for that as well. So here I'm looking at the construction try and verb. So in American English, prescriptively, this would be try to verb, and try and verb is incorrect uh, according to these prescriptive grammars. And it's interesting that those prescriptive rules, even though they were introduced almost 100 years ago, are still quite important in American and Canadian English. So that try and verb is much, much less common than in, for example, Great Britain, Australia, where that prescriptive rule never really caught on. Um, the like construction again, uh, this is the quoted of like and I'm like, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it takes a little bit of time to run on the two billion words. But uh, you can see that, yeah, it is the most common in the US and people think of this as just being an American construction. But you see that it's used a little bit less in Canada, a little bit less in Great Britain, a little bit less in Australia and New Zealand. And then you have Singapore here. I mean, go figure, Singapore is always just, it's just the most fascinating dialect where sometimes it out Americans and out Britishes, even those dialects in terms of really colloquial constructions. Um, all right, uh, we talked before about semantic 
uh, variation between genres in the case of chain, but uh, with a sufficiently large corpus, we can look at semantic variation between dialects. So in this case, I'm looking at scheme, and then I'm looking for adjectives that occur near scheme. I could use the more recent syntax if I wanted. It gives the same results. Notice that in Great Britain, uh, scheme just means plan, program. That's fairly neutral. It's not positive. It's not negative. It's just there. Whereas in American English, nefarious, fraudulent, evil, socialist, uh, get rich quick, and so on. Very negative collocates in American English. The point here is imagine you had a corpus that was one one hundredth the size of globe. So instead of two billion words, it was maybe just 20 million words from different dialects. Now all of a sudden, instead of having 80 tokens or 60 tokens, you might be lucky to have one token. Okay. So when you start dealing with um, collocates, oh, you want to have a corpus that's that's big and robust in that sense. If it's one one hundredth this size, it's just really not going to be possible to be using collocates to look at uh, uh, differences between dialects. The last thing I want to do really quickly in terms of uh, variation between dialects is to look at um, how we can just do a very, very simple search and have it provide really interesting insight into cultural issues. So in this case, I said, look for adjective wife and show and compare India and actually India, other parts of Asia and Africa compared to what Katru and others might call the inner circle dialects. US, Canada, Great Britain, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand. So in kind of the developing world here, we get things like chaste wife or obedient wife. Boy, we never want to try that uh, in the United States or Britain, I'm sure, uh, using those terms. And also things like um, temporary wife or permanent wife. I won't go into exactly what's going on there, but really, really important. Um, differences in terms of the culture of these countries compared to kind of the inner circle countries. And just a simple, simple search like this can help to point out some of those cultural differences. Okay, so a little bit there on genres, a little bit there on dialectal variation. Now what I want to do is spend the next 15, 20 minutes or so talking about uh, historical variation. As I mentioned, I was trained as a historical linguist many years ago, working with Spanish and Portuguese, then I've moved into English. So I'm really interested in historical change. Most of the data that I'm gonna provide here comes from COA, which is 400 million words from the last 200 years or so. This will be updated, go up through 2019 in about a month. COCA can also be used to look at very recent change, the last 30 years or four. So, and then the now corpus can be used to look at very, very recent change. Uh, it's about 10 billion words now, and it is um, uh, added to every single day, about eight to 10 million words of data every single day. So it goes up through yesterday, through uh, June 15th. And tomorrow morning at 5 a.m., it will include data from June 16th. Okay, turning first to the COA corpus, so we've started in the other cases with lexical. It's, you know, that's kind of intuitive, easy to understand. So here we're just looking at uh, words that have bestow, bestowed, bestowing, bestowed. And you can certainly see how that's decreasing over time. Or for example, swell as an adjective. Boy, Jimmy, that's a swell car. You can see that very, very common back in the 1930s. It spikes in the 1930s and then decreases uh, quite a bit after that. No one would use this nowadays. So any word or phrase that you want, yeah, real easy to look at that with uh, COA. Um, looking at prefixes, suffixes, and so on, um, this is just kind of a simple search where I'm just saying find me ism words, words ending in ism, 
and show me the frequency of each of these in each of the 20 um, decades in the corpus. And you can see that some of these have increased over time, uh, whereas others like despotism, heroism, and so on, patriotism, have definitely decreased over time. Um, as far as uh, syntax, I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples here, but I've done quite a bit of research uh, looking at syntactic change with COA, others have as well. Um, you know, at the most basic level, you could just look for example, the construction need to verb, and you see that, you know, it doesn't seem like it's that recent of a construction, but it's actually used about 40 times as frequently as it was even 40, 50 years ago. So need to verb, definite increase there. Or for example, the uh, construction uh, or with negation. Do you have preverbal negation with have uh, in the possessive sense, or do you have post verbal negation. So for example, pre-verbal negation would be, I don't have any time. Whereas post-verbal negation would be, I haven't any time. So you could come in and, you know, this is a really, you know, complicated search here in terms of what you're doing. But that basically means post-verbal negation. You see it decreasing. And then the pre-verbal negation, I don't have the time. You can see that that's increasing quite a bit. And if you take a look at the chart here, the increase in pre-verbal negation, don't have versus haven't. I mean, we see this beautiful S curve here. This is the kind of thing that makes historical linguist hearts just go pitter-patter when they see this. This S curve, the pre-verbal negation kind of you know, lower levels in the 1800s, then in the mid 1900s, it really increases and then it kind of flattens out because it's by far the most common now in American English. So pretty much any syntactic change that you want to look at, um, POA can be very, very useful. And again, for lower frequency constructions, um, you, you're just not going to have enough data in 4 million words. You're just not. So you're gonna need a much, much larger corpus like Koa. Um, before we were talking about semantic variation, chain, for example, for genres or scheme for dialects. Well, we can do the same thing here historically. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying, find me collocates of gay and show me the frequency of each of those collocates by decade. So when you do that, you see that back in the 1800s, collocates of gay are bright, happy, flowers laugh, because obviously gay meant uh, happy, joyful at that time. And then somewhere here in the 1950s, 60s, and the 70s, it changes its meaning to sexual orientation, so lesbian rights, marriage, and so on. And again, imagine you had a corpus 1 100th the size of COA. So instead of 400 million words, 4 million words. Now your token counts for these collocates, I mean, you're going to be, you're just not going to be able to look at changes in collocates very well at all if you don't have a corpus that's uh, robust uh, like um, COA. Um, and just as we did a simple search, adjective wife, and found some interesting cultural uh, issues between different areas of the English-speaking world, we can do the same type of thing historically here. So this simple, simple search, adjective women, okay? And we're saying, show me the adjectives that were used with women back in the 1830s through the 1910s compared to the last 40 years or so. So these are the older ones on the left here, strong-minded woman, clever woman. I mean, the fact that they would need to even comment that shows how sexist this is because women weren't expected to be clever back then. And then all these things, unfortunate, abandoned, wretched, cultivated, focusing on the moral uh, 
uh, fiber of these women, okay? Those sound very, very sexist to us as, as well they should uh, nowadays. And so we obviously get very, very different colicates nowadays. So this very, very simple search shows us some really interesting cultural changes, at least in the United States. A lot of people have used COA to look at um, um, issues like uh, issues in science, religion, environment, gender studies, legal issues. Um, COA and COCA have been used uh, several times uh, 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 in arguments before the United States Supreme Court saying, okay, we think we know what this word means now in 2016 or 2020, but how was that word being used back in the 1870s or the 1880s when a particular law was written? And a large corpus allows you to do that well. Okay, so that's COA, and that's the last 200 years. If we're interested in much more recent change, then we might want to use coca because coca in addition to allowing us to look at different genres also allows us to look at historical change since 1990 from 1990 to 2019 and this is because coca has a, almost exactly the same genre balance year by year by year by year. Um, this is really the only large corpus of English that maintains the same genre balance every single year over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And so we're comparing apples to apples when we compare one year to the next. So again, a uh, very basic level, something like lexical, like perfect storm. You can see that that came out of nowhere. So perfect storm in American English means all the conditions were there, came together for this to happen, and you wouldn't have really expected it. Back in the early 1990s, not used at all, then it really spikes in the early 2000s, but now, at least to my ears, it has kind of this cliche feeling to it, and so it started to actually decrease now in frequency. So any word, phrase, you want to see the frequency over the last 30 years, you can do that. Syntactic change. So for example, end up verbing, you'll end up paying too much money. You can't really see it very well here, but if you look at the frequency per million words, 13, 15, 16, 19, 20, 22, every five-year period, it just keeps increasing which raises some really interesting questions about historical change and how that happens. And again, if you want to use collocates to compare two different sections of the corpus, so in this case, we're saying find me any collocates near web and look in the early 1990s before the World Wide Web became a big deal. And for example, the last 10 years, so this is early 1990s on the left, the last 10 years on the right. Notice that when back then when they were talking about a web, they were talking about a, a web of people or relationships or even a spider web. Whereas nowadays, of course, it's talking about technology. So again, we're using collocates here to compare two different sections of the corpus here for 1990s versus the last 10 years. Okay, um, so that's, COCA, and COCA is nice because again, it allows us to look at very recent um, change. If we wanna look at even more recent change, we might use the now corpus. So the now corpus, as I mentioned, um, it just keeps growing. So uh, April, 2020, about 212 million words. May 2020, 233 million words. June 2020, we're up to almost uh, 120 million words. And by the end of June, we're halfway through now, end of June, there'll be about 240 million words. So every night, about eight to 10 million words of data get added to this corpus. 
It starts in 2010 and it goes up through yesterday. Okay, just to give you a couple of examples of how this works, um, let's look for the word fidget spinner. So this is one of those phrases that just came out of nowhere uh, two or three years ago. It refers to that little toy that you spin it. And you can see that it uh, definitely spikes in the first half of 2017. And it looks like right around the middle of May. So you can even see the frequency in 10 day periods since 2010. So fidget spinner peaked somewhere in the middle of May uh, 2017. So there's some examples. If you look in Google Trends, which uh, measures what people are searching for, not how much things are used in text, but how much people are searching for it, when does this spike? The middle of May 2017. So uh, the now corpus me or, uh, mirrors perfectly, perfectly what people were talking about and searching at that time, even to a 10 day period, okay? One other example of now, uh, this is something that a lot of people have looked about, uh, looked at, thought about fake news, okay? When did fake news, when did this term start? It's really not being used 2011, 13, 15, first half of 2016, but then in 20, the latter half of 2016, it really spikes. And you can even come in and you can search by 10 day period. And you notice here that November 1st through 10th, 2016, hardly anyone's using it. And then by November 11th through 20th, 2016, it explodes and it just increases. So what happened uh, right at that time? obviously the U.S. elections on November 8, 2016. That's when fake news just comes out of nowhere, okay? And so again, the really nice thing about that corpus is it allows us to look with very, very, very fine grain detail at anything we're interested in. I mean, here I'm looking at Lexus, but even new uses, fun uses of suffixes like gate, meaning scandal, you can map those out. Last example I wanna give just very, very quickly. Uh, a couple months ago, I got the idea of, well, if I'm already getting all this data every night for the now corpus, 10 to, excuse me, eight to 10 million words a night, why not extract out of that every night the articles dealing with coronavirus? And that's about, it's over the last three months, it's been about 40 to 50, um, percent of all the articles in the now corpus have dealt with coronavirus. So coronavirus, it starts in January, January 1st, uh, 2020, and it goes up just like the now corpus through yesterday. So any phrase you're interested in, for example, flatten the curve, see the huge spike here back in March. And then this is just kind of the most beautiful search in the world because it's actually iconic in the sense that the curve, the frequency of flatten the curve actually flattens out over time as people are not talking about uh, flattening the curve as much. Um, or for example, in the United States, there's been this big issue about reopening, you know, when we should reopen stuff. And you can see that in, April of um, this year, a lot of discussion of that, but now that things are beginning to open up, not as many people talking about that. And the interesting thing about this corpus is rather than looking in just 10 day periods, you can actually look day by day, by day, by day, by day, the frequency of any of these words, phrases, and then again, I clicked on June 13th. So these are all from June 13th. So the point is this corpus is designed to be hopefully kind of the um, definitive record of what's happening with coronavirus in terms of culture and society. 
my hope is that this corpus is used for many years uh, into the future as people are looking at, at what happened here in 2020. Okay, so uh, I've got about 45 minutes. I think that was the time that I had. Um, so again, the point here, looking at genre-based variation, dialectal variation, historical variation, using large corpora, lots of things you can do. Great. Uh, thank you, Mark, so far. So we, we have lots of, of questions in the Q&A, if you would like to have a look. So Tony, do you want me to take those or do you want to take the ones you think are interesting? Uh, okay, um, so let me let me have a look and then I'll ask you these questions. Let me see. Uh, so there's one here from uh, Mohammed. He's asking, is the globe corpus available? I think he means to download. Yeah, so uh, all of the corpora that I've been talking about here, my screen is still shared, right, Tony? Yes. Um, so uh, all of the corpora that I've been talking about here, you can come in and you can um, download that data. So pretty much all of the 2 billion words is downloadable for Globe. Um, yeah. Um, okay, one by Iman. Uh, he's asking, do you do you have data about where your users come from, and whether they are more language learners than researchers, or the other way around? Yeah, I mean that data all gets logged in the database, but for privacy reasons, even though theoretically I could look at it, I don't look at it. I mean, um, I, I guess I could look at you know not by person but by region. Mm -hmm. what people in China or Saudi Arabia are search looking for. I haven't done that. It would be interesting data though. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this one by Sadat, uh, the question is, how do you interpret shall be deemed? Uh, well, I don't know. Let's uh, take a look here. And uh, it sounds kind of legal to me. Well, that is interesting. So yeah, it's used in academic, but here in uh, just other web pages, oh yeah, notice copyright.gov, bisonet.gov. So we get all these government web pages here. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a legal term and that comes out pretty nicely in the corpus. Mm -hmm. um, so this one by Katerina, she's asking, Mm, so you mentioned it's possible to do a morphological search in COCA. Is it possible to expand on mechanisms behind this morphological search? I wonder what is the precision of morphological parsing in COCA? Um, so the corpus is not morphologically parsed at all. So, I mean, you already have to have in mind a particular prefix, suffix, uh, words containing a particular root. Um, but I should mention that um, you can also come in and you can create customized word lists. So you could come in and, you know, these are synonyms of uh, beautiful. And you can make your own word lists. So if there's 270 words that you're interested in to have a particular morpheme, you, you're going to need to know ahead of time uh, sometimes what those those particular words are, but then you can just use all of those words as a clump as part of your search. And so, yeah, the ability to have customized word lists um, can be useful for that. Okay, this one uh, coming from Alex. The question is, uh, could you advise, would you suggest which corpora to use when you're looking at legal English? Yeah, so there's a lot of corpora that I obviously didn't talk about here for reasons of time. But for that one, maybe the most interesting one would be the Supreme Court corpus. 
These are um, uh, opinions from the US Supreme Court and it's 130 million words from um, for the last 200 years or so. So that might be the most useful. Okay, this one coming from Tristan, uh, the question is, can you speak about the accuracy level of morphological or part of speech tagging in your corpora and which types of searches might be more or less sensitive to potentially mistagged data? Yeah, I mean, so that's a good question. That, that's, you know, just kind of a general issue that people in, in corpus linguistics and uh, computational linguistics are interested in accuracy and so on. This, uh, all of my corpora, all the English ones, I mean, I've got ones for Spanish and Portuguese as well, but um, the English ones, these are all based on the uh, clause tagger from Lancaster University. And I personally find it to be one of the most useful and, and accurate taggers of English. Um, uh, in my mind, certainly is um, accurate as, let's say, tree tagger or other well-known taggers. Um, but uh, yeah, I use the clause tagger and uh, it's not proprietary. It, this is the same tagger that was used to tag the original British national corpus. So.